So I would like to start by thanking the organizers for having me here and for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, recent work uh, in this uh, great workshop. Uh, it's an amazing place that, uh, that you have an amazing center, so I'm very happy to be part of, um, of this conference. Um, so I pretty much want to continue where Francois stopped, uh, basically before the lunch break, um, and discuss uh, how much of what we see in pre-thermalization physics in quantum systems is actually quantum and how much of it um, can be understood in terms of classical dynamics. So, uh, hence the title of, of the talk. So, pre-thermalization in periodically driven systems, quantum or, or classical. Um, now, why do we want to study periodically driven systems to begin with? Um, practically, uh, especially recently, they are very important uh, applications in terms of Floquet engineering. So, the use of periodic drives uh, to engineer steady states uh, in Hamiltonians which are not accessible uh, by any other means in static systems. This can be, for example, in ultra-cold atoms. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, in ultra-cold atoms um, or photonic insulators, superconducting qubits, or even in realistic quantum materials. So there's a lot of experiments um, currently at the, at the level of single particle systems uh, that have been using periodic drives. Uh, and all these experiments seem, seem to suffer from one form, in one form or another from uh, unwanted heating effects. Therefore, uh, studying the effect of interactions in periodically driven systems is uh, potentially important for, uh, for these uh, experiments. But also, you know, from the point of view of uh, fundamental uh, physics, it is also important as, um, uh, to study periodically driven systems. You can think of this in the following way. Um, if you have, you know, sort, sort of the, the world of equilibrium and the world of non-equilibrium, then periodically driven or Floquet systems uh, live at the boundary of, of equilibrium and non-equilibrium. Um, and yesterday we already heard uh, one way talking about uh, Floquet phases of matter which are truly non-equilibrium and which um, uh, do not have uh, equilibrium counterparts uh, in, in, in a certain sense. Um, and uh, Floquet systems are particularly suitable for approaching the non-equilibrium realm, if you wish. So there's, you know, another reason uh, from a fundamental perspective why we would like to study such systems. Um, so, you know, without further, further ado, let me just jump straight ahead into the system that I want to study, into the model. Um, and um, basically, the, the rest of the talk is going to have two parts. First, I'm going to discuss a quantum system and pre-thermalization in a quantum periodically driven system. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to switch to a classical system, um, and we're going to see uh, how they behave. So, let me just take my, my favorite Hamiltonian, my favorite periodically driven systems, uh, system is given here. So you can think of this uh, uh, periodic switching, uh, periodic step drive, where for half a period I apply the system, uh, the Hamiltonian H checks to the system. So this is simply uh, a sum of, uh, of, of, uh, of SX term, uh, terms. Um, and then uh, in the other half period I apply the HZ term, and the HZ term has a Z field, but it also has a nearest neighbor interaction term. Um, and this model has been studied by, by, by many people. Um, I think Tomas studied it like long, long time ago. Uh, um, uh, what is important about, about this uh, system uh, is, you know, it's a spin a half system. And then what I also want to do is I want to associate a frequency of switching, if you wish, uh, which is just 2 pi over the driving period. So even though this um, uh, drive has multiple harmonics, uh, I mean, essentially infinitely many, uh, I, uh, my frequency here is, is the frequency of switching. This is what, what I would like to uh, refer uh, to it. So now let's see what happens if we take a large driving frequency, so a frequency that's much larger than any single particle uh, energy scale in the problem, uh, and I want to see how this system absorbs energy. So what's going to happen? Uh, now, if I say absorbs energy, then, you know, I want to measure the energy, then I need to specify a Hamiltonian with respect to uh, which I'm measuring the energy. And, um, you know, it makes sense in this case at high frequency to use simply the time average Hamiltonian, which in this case is just one half of the sum of the two terms. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to pick up as an initial state the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And I'm going to evolve that ground state with the exact dynamics. So notice that this ground state is no longer an eigenstate of, of this exact dynamics in, in whatever sense uh, it means. Uh, and then I want to measure this energy density. So basically, the exactly evolved state um, uh, measured, in, sorry, the uh, average energy measured in the exactly evolved state. So on the left, I'm basically seeing you the, uh, the result. Uh, as a function of time. So L here is, if you wish, the, uh, the driving cycle. So it makes sense to measure energy at the end of every cycle. Uh, as a function of the driving cycles in, on a log scale, 
um, you see that uh, for a fairly long time, the system kind of doesn't want to absorb energy, and then it starts uh, heating up until it reaches an infinite temperature state. It basically maximizes its full absorption capacity. Um, and uh, already some time ago, it was predicted that uh, periodically driven systems eventually have to reach an infinite temperature state. Uh, however, you know, the time scale at which uh, they reach this state um, uh, scales exponentially with the driving frequency, and this is a phenomenon known as, uh, as Floquet pre-thermalization. Now, very quickly, I want to give an intuitive argument, basically to repeat one way's intuitive argument from yesterday about Floquet pre-thermalization. I'm not sure if Wojciech is going to detail on exactly uh, how that goes, I presume so, so I leave the details to next week. Uh, and, and simply, very intuitively, just uh, for those of you who uh, weren't there yesterday, if I take a many-body um, many system, uh, this many-body system has single particle processes. So this can be, for example, spin flips or, uh, or uh, nearest neighbor interactions. And now uh, what I want is I, I want to, to shine some periodic drive on my system with a frequency omega. Now we know that energy, if we take the frequency into account, then the energy of the drive and the system has to be conserved. And therefore, if my system is going to observe uh, an energy drive quantum, uh, then I better find a way of accommodating, you know, this uh, quantum in terms of local spin flip processes. However, the frequency is much larger than the local energy scales. Therefore, I need, you know, a number of these processes uh, in order to accommodate, uh, to accommodate for, for these flips, for these effects. And uh, it so happens that if we have a large number of processes, uh, in this particular case, uh, the energy absorption is exponentially suppressed uh, in the driving frequency. Now, of course, this is a very hand-waving argument, and as I said, uh, you're going to see, hopefully, a more rigorous version of this next week. But, uh, in a sense, this justifies the existence of this long pre-thermal window that, that I showed you on the previous plot, and this is essentially ideal, an ideal playground for Floquet engineering in many body systems. So this is why, uh, for example, you should care about it. Um, now, Oh, I also wanted to say that pretty much or almost everyone who's been working on pre-thermalization in quantum systems in one or another form was here or will be here in this workshop. So there's a lot of experts here if, if you guys are interested to, uh, to talk to. Um, okay, so now the question is how can we understand this pre-thermal plateau? And I would like to briefly introduce Floquet theory for this purpose. Uh, the cornerstone of Floquet theory is Floquet's theorem which postulates that the uh, time evolution operator uh, factorizes into two unitaries, um, a, a micromotion operator P, which is periodic with the same period um, uh, as the Hamiltonian, and a time independent, that is to say static, Floquet uh, Hamiltonian. Now, if you look at the system stroboscopically, that is to say at integer multiples of the uh, driving uh, period, uh, what you see is that the uh, Floquet unitary um, is essentially just given by e to the minus i t h f. And this already looks potentially uh, very similar to static systems, uh, with the only caveat that we don't really know what the Floquet Hamiltonian is. Uh, and so this is, you know, a, a, a question, so how can we actually, you know, compute this, uh, this object? In general, uh, it is not possible to compute it. However, uh, if the driving frequency is high enough, then one can use the so-called inverse frequency expansion, uh, for example, a Magnus expansion, um, where the ansatz is to take the very definition of the time evolution operator over one period uh, and to postulate that it has a time independent form, after which one can expand the right and the left hand side in terms of the inverse frequency and collect the terms. Um, and in case you're interested, the first two terms in this, in this expansion for the Floquet Hamiltonian uh, are just the time average Hamiltonian, as it makes sense, and then there's uh, more non-local terms that, uh, that, that show up. So this uh, procedure is essentially equivalent to the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff Baker formula for the step drive. Uh, and you can think of it as a generalization of this formula. Okay, so that's everything we need from Floquet theory. Um, now, how do we understand the pre-thermal plateau? Now, the, I mean, the expression for the uh, average energy, as I defined it on, on the previous slide, is, is essentially the uh, time average, Hamil so, sorry, the average Hamiltonian um, measured in the evolved, in the exactly evolved state. Well, now I've introduced an approximation uh, to, to the Floquet unitary, um, and so I can approximate this uh, quantity uh, up to a given order n in that case. Now, the energy density of the prethermal plateau 
uh, that's the value here on the y-axis, uh, is essentially given by the diagonal ensemble uh, with respect to the Magnus Hamiltonian. So if you wish, uh, uh, and I'm now uh, referring to uh, the talks by Marcus Rigo last week, um, one can uh, compute the long time limit uh, using the eigenstates of the Floquet unitary. These are these JFNs. Um, and one can effectively derive a diagonal ensemble uh, with the help of which one can estimate the prethermal uh, uh, energy uh, scale. Uh, and of course, you know, this ensemble depends on the order to which you go in the expansion. Uh, so if you uh, start from uh, a zeroth order, you're going to be off because zeroth order essentially assumes infinite frequency, but maybe you're driving at a finite frequency. So if you keep including the first couple of orders, it gets better and better until you eventually hit an optimal order in this expansion. And this optimal order gives you exactly the value of the prethermal plateau. Um, and then through this energy density and using the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, uh, one can associate a temperature for the prethermal uh, regime. Um, Yes, okay. So what I want to say is that the prethermal physics is essentially governed by, by the, uh, by the uh, Magnus effective uh, Hamiltonian. Now there's four stages of thermalization in uh, periodically driven systems uh, at high frequency. And I would like to uh, show you these four stages here on, on this plot. Uh, so the first stage happens at, at short times. And this is a stage of uh, so-called constrained thermalization where the system pre-thermalizes uh, to the uh, effective Magnus uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, I'm saying it pre-thermalizes in exactly the same way as, as Francois. There is an effective uh, quasi-conservation law in that sense, uh, in, in this case, which is, uh, which is this uh, uh, conserved time-independent uh, energy. Now, okay, so then the system enters the pre-thermal plateau. In the pre-thermal plateau, we expect that, uh, that we have a more or less thermal state with respect to uh, the Magnus Hamiltonian. But then eventually, at longer times, the system realizes that it's periodically driven, that energy is not conserved, and it starts absorbing energy um, from the drive until this is stage three, which is unconstrained thermalization, uh, until it reaches a featureless infinite temperature state uh, in, in, in stage four. So these are like four generic uh, stages. And you can think of the first two stages as a quench to the Magnus Hamiltonian. So everything up to here, roughly, is captured by, by the Magnus expansion. Uh, and everything that, that, that happens um, you know, in stages three and four uh, is not captured by the Magnus expansion. So maybe an interesting uh, uh, question would be, you know, how do we understand microscopically what's happening in the system uh, in this stage three, the stage of unconstrained thermalization? So I would like to show you, um, okay, I would like to show you uh, uh, resonances that appear in, in, in the many body spectrum, which are uh, induced by, so these are resonances between many body stage, which are, which are induced by the periodic drive. So in order to see these resonances, I uh, do the following. So I diagonalize exactly the Floquet Hamiltonian or the Floquet unitary. And I look up for my quasi energy spectrum and I pick up two adjacent quasi energy levels uh, Whose, uh, differ I mean, yeah, whose difference is, uh, energy difference is especially small. Now, these two ad adjacent energy levels uh, correspond to two Floquet states, which I call red and blue. And then, of course, you know, there's many such states, but I'm interested in, in, in a pair, red and blue, uh, uh, whose off-diagonal matrix element in the average Hamiltonian, remember, that's the energy that, that I'm interested in, is large, okay? So large uh, compared to, to the typical value. Um, and then I have basically two distinguished Floquet states that I have picked. And what I want to do is I want to, uh, if you wish, project those states onto the exact, uh, sorry, onto the approximate uh, Floquet states. These are the states obtained using the inverse frequency expansion or the Magnus expansion. Why I'm doing this? Because this uh, essentially is going to give me, if you wish, the, if, in a certain sense, the participation ratio of these states. Um, it's going to show it's going to show me um, the exact Floquet states. Which approximate states do they have a certain weight on? Um, and so, by doing this, I'm effectively able to visualize where these resonances appear uh, in the Floquet spectrum. So notice that these are exact Floquet states. So their spectrum, the exact Floquet spectrum, is folded. That is to say, the energies are only defined defined modulo omega. Uh, whereas by projecting them onto the approximate inverse frequency Floquet Hamiltonian, I'm able to see which uh, Floquet zone, if you wish, they come from. So the vertical lines in these plots define uh, arbitrarily, but they define my Floquet zones, and the distance between them in exactly, is exactly the driving frequency. 
Now, if the frequency is large enough so that we actually see pre-thermalization in, uh, in the system, um, what happens is I find uh, very uh, narrow resonances, um, and these resonances are essentially very weakly coupled. Therefore, uh, the system does not absorb energy until exponentially long times. But if I go at lower frequency, so all I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm changing the frequency, then you can see that there's multiple effects. So first, these resonances become broader and broader, but more importantly, uh, ever so more, more uh, approximate states uh, take into account, I mean, uh, participate in, 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 in this resonance. Uh, so what this means is that the exact Floquet eigenstate, if I looked at it from the point of view of the approximate Hamiltonian, looks more and more delocalized. And this uh, is a precursor for, uh, for an easy absorption, if you wish. It facilitates the system to absorb energy. And these are, of course, all many-body states. I think I mentioned this. Um, uh, and now, if the frequency is, is uh, uh, low enough, uh, then, of course, uh, if you wish, every single, uh, I mean, the states are fully delocalized, so there is no more structure in this uh, uh, in, in this resonance, and therefore the system does not even show a pre-thermal plateau, so it heats up right away to an infinite temperature state. So this is uh, more or less the story, uh, uh, very briefly, about, about quantum uh, Floquet pre-thermalization. Um, and uh, as uh, pretty much everyone who's worked on, on, on this topic, um, uh, we're all aware of, of, of the detrimental ef uh, effect of finite size, uh, um, you know, finite size system that we are inevitably uh, have to deal with uh, because, you know, there's still no quantum computers around, so we have to struggle with finite system sizes. Now, because of, oops, uh, because of that, the, the only, sorry about that, uh, the only, uh, you know, 100% safe method to study thermalization is still exact analyzation, so uh, system sizes are limited. Um, but the problem is that, you know, the many-body bandwidth actually does scale with the system size, so if you assume that you would like to study a high-frequency drive, in such a way that your uh, frequency exceeds the many-body bandwidth, because this can happen, uh, then even though you're studying a many-body system, you're effectively preventing your system from absorbing energy. So this is not the correct regime that we would like to study. Uh, what this means to say uh, is, is that if I have a cap on the system size, uh, then I effectively have a cap on the, on the driving frequency as well. The correct limit in this case is you have to first send the system size to infinity and then choose the frequency in such a way that, you know, you have folding in the spectrum so that you can see these resonances that I showed you. Because, you know, if the frequency is too large, then the entire spectrum is going to fall within a single Floquet zone, so you won't be able to see resonances at all, therefore the system won't be able to absorb. Another potential problem that happens in, in uh, these uh, systems, finite size systems, is that close to the edge of the spectrum, typically we have huge finite size effects and gaps. And uh, this, of course, uh, uh, limits, uh, uh, you know, prevents the system from, from absorbing uh, properly. And I'm saying this because we know that in the thermodynamic limit, uh, the gaps between, uh, between uh, adjacent energy levels uh, should vanish exponentially. Okay, so these are all problems. Um, and of course, one can ask the question, you know, can we avoid these issues or at least some of them? And, you know, if we can avoid them, then what can we sacrifice? You know, which uh, feature of our system can we sacrifice uh, in order to continue with the study of, of Floquet pre-thermalization? And I want to do, you know, uh, uh, I want to sort of get rid of a very drastic feature. I want to get rid of the quantumness of my system. So, and here's now the, uh, the relation to, to Francois' talk. So now what I want to do is I want to study a classical version of the same problem. So I should say that this was work done by, by Owen Howen, uh, Howell mostly. Um, so literally what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the exact same Hamiltonian, except this time I don't have quantum degrees of freedom, quantum spin a half degrees of freedom, but I have classical rotors. Uh, in particular, um, in particular uh, the classical rotors uh, have a fixed length, so I put them on the unit sphere, um, and they satisfy, classically, not the, uh, not the commutator, but the Poisson bracket. So that's the system, um, and I'm going to try to study pre-thermalization um, in this classical, periodically driven, many-body system. Now, we do want to study exponentially long times, but we also have a, a chaotic system, classically, and one has to be a little bit uh, cautious here about how this exactly is done, because we know that chaotic systems uh, have exponential sensitivity to the initial condition, uh, and what this means is that if you, we are, for example, uh, solving for the dynamics of our system numerically, we have to make sure that numerical errors are not amplified exponentially by, by classical chaos. Uh, 
Now, luckily, and this is also part of the reason why we chose here a step drive, if you have a step-driven uh, step Hamiltonian, um, what you can do is you can solve the equations of motion exactly. Uh, how does it go? Well, we have two half periods, so let's try to solve them separately for each half period. Uh, in particular, then, the solution after uh, uh, one period is going to be given by this mapping uh, tau 1 compose tau 2, uh, and then if I want to uh, if I wanna, uh, go to L periods afterwards, then I just need to apply this mapping L times. Now, this is essentially the equivalent of the Floquet unitary, except in this case, this is not a uh, linear transformation. It is a nonlinear transformation, and we need the nonlinearity because without nonlinearity, classically, we wouldn't see chaos. Uh, so let's take the second half period first, where the dynamics is a simple rotation. So it's very easy to, uh, to figure out what, what tau 2 is. It's just a rotation about the x-axis. But then for, uh, for the first half period, we have a rotation about the z-axis. However, the nonlinearity modifies the frequency of rotation. In particular, the frequency becomes now side-dependent. Uh, but, you know, the cool thing here is that one can still write down this expression, and it is straightforward to evaluate uh, the dynamics numerically now, and this is done exactly. Uh, this allows us to go to exponentially long times without picking up any errors. Um, now, yes? 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 No, it does not prevent the problem of chaos. I do want to study chaotic, chaotic dynamics, and that's the, the only, yeah, the, the point that I was trying to make is that if we try to study chaotic dynamics numerically, numerically solving the equations of motion, okay, yes, exactly. Well, it's not just easier, but it's also safer if I showed you, no? Okay. If you're fine, then I'm totally fine, and some people, you know, because small, small numerical errors can, can get amplified by, no, by the nonlinearity, by the chaotic behavior, because you have exponential sensitivity to initial conditions. I mean, I'm going to be showing results here to long, long times, OK? OK, but anyway, if, if it doesn't bother you, then you don't need to worry about it. OK, um, so yes, so now I would like to show you, OK, so uh, good, so we want, we're after thermalization and pre-thermalization in this system. So once again, uh, I want to measure the uh, time average Hamiltonian as before. This time, the initial state is not just the uh, ground state of that average Hamiltonian. Uh, for the same reason as I mentioned, so classically, because of chaos, it doesn't make sense to look at a single trajectory. What we really need here is a whole ensemble of initial states. And the way I create an ensemble is to take this ground state, so this ground state of my system locally on every side is essentially a rotor pointing somewhere on the sphere. And now what I'm doing is I'm putting a small initial noise drawn from a uniform distribution to that angle. So on every side, I perturb the angles uh, randomly, uh, and, this, uh, and, and I can create a whole ensemble of such states. So this is now my, my initial ensemble. And then, uh, similar to before, what I'm interested in is, is the uh, ensemble average now. Of, of the uh, energy, of the average energy as a function of time. Uh, this quantity here, Q, is essentially nothing but the energy normalized between uh, in the interval 0 and 1. So if I don't absorb energy at all, then I stay at the energy of the ground state. So this quantity is, is basically 0. Uh, and if I go to infinite temperature, then this quantity becomes 1. So Q is essentially what we saw before, just normalized between 0 and 1. And I'm also interested in the energy fluctuations, also normalized between, uh, well, not between 0 and 1, but also normalized in a proper way. OK, so here's the data now. Um, on the x-axis, I'm showing you Q, so essentially the energy absorption. On the y-axis, on a log scale, I'm showing you the driving uh, cycles. So we're going here up to 10 to the, I think, 10 driving cycles. Um, and voila, as before, we see the same four stages. So these are this vertical line with respect to the blue curve. So we see an initial stage of constrained thermalization, a pre-thermal plateau. Uh, in the second stage, a third stage of unconstrained thermalization, and then uh, a featureless infinite temperature state. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it, it might have been, you know, surprising or not surprising to you that, that, that you see this. Um, what's more interesting uh, is that if you look at the uh, fluctuations here of the energy, uh, there's a characteristic peak for every frequency, and the characteristic peak appears exactly in, in the unconstrained thermalization uh, stage. And now what I want to do is I want to take the 
time, if you wish, the L max that corresponds to this maximum value here. And then I want to plot it as a function of frequency um, on a semi-log scale. So even without placing a fit, you see a very nice straight line, which is an, you know, a numerical uh, evidence for the fact that, um, that uh, thermalization happens, you know, is exponentially suppressed in, in these classical many-body systems. So again, uh, as we have expected from, from quantum systems, except now I see the same phenomenon in a classical many-body spin chain. Um, so just to show you some related results by other groups, so we are not the only ones to study classical uh, pre-thermalization in Foucault systems. So the uh, Barry Lang group and the Trieste uh, groups uh, also studied this. So they looked at a coupled kicked pendulum. Now, the only difference between this system and the, my rotors is essentially the fact that the rotors are fixed uh, to be of unit length. That is to say, their angular momentum is fixed. Whereas, you know, uh, this coupled kick pendula, they can wind forever. So, you know, they are unconstrained uh, in terms of uh, energy absorption. And what you see here, they looked in particular first at the, at the, uh, at the diffusive behavior, and they found some subdiffusion and Arnold diffusion. Uh, in particular, when the driving frequency is small, uh, they, they found a region of, of vanishing diffusion constant, that is to say uh, uh, that the system does not absorb. And then in the subsequent work, uh, they also looked at the kinetic energy as a function of time. And once again, they see this nice pre-thermal behavior. Uh, uh, the only difference here in this uh, system of, of pendula is that there is no infinite, I mean, the infinite temperature uh, state is, is, does not happen at, at um, well, how do, I, how do I explain it properly? So the density of states of the system is unbounded, therefore the energy keeps growing and growing. The proper way of saying it, but more importantly for our purposes, for the purposes of the talk, we do see this pre-thermal behavior in this, uh, in this classical many-body periodically driven system. Um, okay, yes, and, and you can also discuss then the localization diagram of this. Now, that's nice. So the next question is, can we actually use the Magnus expansion again uh, and say something about, about the pre-thermal plateau? Because, you know, the, just the fact that it exists is, is, is nice, but, you know, can we also describe it somehow physically? Um, so just let's close our eyes and naively replace commutators by Poisson brackets in, in our expressions, compute the corresponding uh, expansion, uh, and, then, and then see what happens numerically. And indeed, you see, so this is now energy absorption as a function of time. On the left plot, you see short times. On the long plot, you see the long times on a long scale. And then the different colors correspond to the different, uh, um, to the different order to which we go in the expansion. Um, so what we do here is, is we measure the Hamiltonian in the higher order of the expansion. And as you, as you expect, uh, the, uh, the, 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 higher, the higher the order of the expansion, the lower the, the you know, the, the pre-thermal plateau goes, it goes, uh, you know, it's corrected by, by, by these uh, powers of the frequency. Um, so this is all nice, but what about um, observables? Uh, and indeed, here's a, you know, a simple observable, the magnetization. Um, the blue dot is the exact evolution of the magnetization. So this is the ensemble average, it's important to say. Um, and these are the different orders of the expansion at the finite, relatively small frequency. I think the frequency is about, uh, five or so uh, in units of, 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 of the interaction between the spins. Um, and here you see that, you know, already going to a sufficiently high order captures the dynamics very nicely. Uh, so this is at a fixed frequency. What about other frequencies? Uh, now this plot is pretty much incomprehensible, but what you should take home from it is that if I go to high uh, frequencies, then uh, I match my expectation uh, uh, from the diagonal ensemble with the one with the exact uh, dynamics. Uh, both for the Z component and for the X component of the magnetization and by conservation also uh, for the Y component. But if the frequency is slow enough, then pre-thermalization doesn't happen at all um, and, we, uh, and, and the system goes to you know, the infinite temperature state right away. So it seems like the ensemble average is captured by, by the prediction, the ensemble average in the pre-thermal plateau is captured by the, by the predictions of the Magnus expansion. Um, and this is interesting and potentially useful because this shows us how we can take these ideas about Floquet engineering and transfer them over from quantum, from the quantum domain to, uh, to, to, to the classical domain. And there's been uh, interesting uh, uh, papers uh, uh, along these lines uh, that, that are showing up recently. I mean, yeah. Okay. Now, why does this Magnus expansion work is, is a question that, uh, that you know, one, one, one can ask. And in particular, this is an interesting question, if you think about it, because 
the classical equations of motion are nonlinear. And remember, we require the nonlinearity because without the nonlinearity, we won't see chaos. But this is a problem for applying Floquet's theorem because Floquet's theorem requires a linear equation of motion. So you could say, well, you know, you took commutators uh, and you replaced them by Poisson brackets, and then it seemed to magically work. Uh, but based on, you know, on, 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 on this reasoning, you know, it's, you know, there's still something missing there. You know? It's not completely clear why it works. And so I want to present very briefly uh, different ways for, uh, different arguments for why, uh, why this should work. So the first argument is actually by Takashi Mori, who was here last week. Um, uh, he basically took his proof for quantum systems and he said, well, if I have a classical spin system, what I can do is I can consider the large S, li I can consider it as a large S limit of some quantum system. And moreover, he took this large S spin variable and then he decomposed it into a bunch of spin a halves locally at every side, for, for which for a single spin a half, he actually had, had a quantum proof. Uh, for why prethermalization should exist and why uh, the dynamics should be of the prethermal plateau should be given by the Magnus Hamiltonian up to an optimal order. Um, so now this is very nice, and of course the non-trivial part of, of, of this work was uh, to show that if you actually you know, do take the limits properly, then the result still holds, and you can indeed see, um, you can indeed see uh, that uh, Energy is, is exponentially suppressed. And I was, I was, as I was chatting with Wenwei uh, earlier today, you know, it's all very nice, but it's kind of peculiar that we use a quantum proof to say something about a classical system. So you know, probably there is also a classical argument for, for, why, for why this happens, but so far I don't know of, uh, of any. Well, maybe there is actually a classical argument. So here's an alternative viewpoint. So I said that the Hamilton's equation of motion are nonlinear, and they are nonlinear. But this is not the right comparison if you want to think about, if you want to compare them directly to quantum mechanics. What's more appropriate in this case is to actually look at the Liouville equation for, for the density, of, for the phase space density. And the Liouville equation is linear in super operator space. So essentially, um, if, yeah, if I define a Liouvillean operator out of this equation, uh, then this is going to be a linear operator on super, uh, on super operator space, and then I have a linear period, time, time periodic operator, so I can apply Floquet's theorem, and indeed you can do that, uh, and what you find uh, is that the expansion, the Magnus expansion that you can write down for the Liouville equation would then transfer to a, to a Magnus expansion for the Hamiltonian one-to-one, -one, which is a justification of, of why uh, essentially what I showed you on the previous slide uh, works. So this is all nice, and then there's only one important caveat here. So it works, but it works for the distribution, for a whole distribution. It doesn't work for a single trajectory, right? And this is kind of interesting. In fact, uh, uh, you can do a check, a check so you can take a system, you can, you can take an initial state, you can evolve it with the exact Floquet Hamiltonian, we can evolve it with, with an approximate, say, Magnus uh, computed Hamiltonian. And then what you can do is you can compute the overlap. And this is interesting because, you know, we know that at the moment there's a small deviation. Uh, classical chaos is eventually going to, to pick up this deviation and amplify it exponentially. And as you see, this deviation is amplified at, at times which are uh, much smaller than, than any of the uh, huge timescales I was showing you on the, on the previous slide. So if you look into a single trajectory in phase space, uh, the single trajectory is not going to be captured by, by the Magnus Hamiltonian. And this is consistent with this picture because this picture says that what we need is we need full ensembles. If we need the whole uh, phase space density. Uh, so if you take actually an ensemble of, of uh, system, which is essentially the physically meaningful thing to do here, exactly because of chaos, then it works. Uh, so there's, you know, again, compared to quantum systems, it's not really that, uh, that strange because in quantum mechanics, essentially, we also take averages uh, over, over quantum fluctuations in that sense. Uh, so I would say that you know, the, the, the quantum picture should, should be better uh, described or better compared to, to the Liouville uh, picture in that, say, in that case. But I wanted to mention this caveat because uh, it's essentially important. Okay, so uh, last thing I want to uh, show you uh, is a nice numerical experiment that, that we did. So, uh, you know, we wanted to ask the question, so how prethermal uh, is, is the prethermal plateau? So, as I argued before, the prethermal plateau is essentially the thermal uh, state with respect to this uh, corrected Magnus Hamiltonian up to the optimal order. Uh, but we decided to test this, and to test it, we, uh, we did the following experiment. So I took my initial ensemble of, of noisy uh, initial states, right? 
And then I evolved my ensemble, actually Owen evolved the ensemble, uh, up to the beginning of the prethermal plateau. So I, I, you know, we, we waited until the ensemble prethermalizes. And then if this is a true you know, thermal state at, at, you know, at, at, this, uh, at the temperature with respect to HF, then this ensemble should be a Gaussian ensemble. So in particular, if I measure its energy and its energy variance, then this should be enough to uniquely characterize this ensemble. So then we can do the following experiment. So we evolved the initial ensemble into the prethermal uh, plateau. And then I measure the energy and the energy variance of my ensemble. And then I throw the ensemble away. What I do is I construct an alternative ensemble, which is a Gaussian ensemble, which has exactly the same energy and energy variance. And then I start the dynamics again. And I repeat this process every 10 to the 3 uh, uh, cycles. And 10 to the 3 is about the time that I need for the, for the initial thermalization to happen. What you see here is two sets of curves, one which, uh, which uh, contains this uh, restarting procedure, this you know, restarting of the ensemble, and one which does not. So if I don't restart the ensemble, if I just look at my you know, usual dynamics, then you know, the system heats up after something like 10 to the 6 uh, driving cycles. But if I start perturbing the system, assuming that it was in a thermal ensemble, uh, then it actually starts heating up much faster. So this is kind of interesting because uh, it hints at some additional properties that, uh, that these pre-thermal states might have, uh, which distinguish them from a truly thermal state. And this is something that is you know, currently an ongoing uh, um, uh, problem. So uh, it's not completely clear to me why this, why this happens. So I'd be happy to chat with you if you have ideas about that. OK, so already uh, heard the bell. Uh, so it's nice to, to wrap up. Uh, so, okay, I presented you results about Floquet prethermalization in first in quantum and then in classical systems. So here is again, uh, you know, the, the energy absorption curves. Now on the left you see the quantum ones for 22 spins was the largest I could do. Well, I could have done larger, but for the same purposes. Uh, the classical one was done for 100 spins and we checked that it doesn't change if you even go to 1,000 spins. And they essentially look very similar. Uh, there's some differences with respect to the time scales, but they might require some, uh, some uh, proper you know, fixing the, of, the, of the scales of the spin uh, size in order to, to do the honest comparison. What I want to say is that you know, I don't really see much of a difference here, and I don't know if you do, but one of the questions is what is really quantum about, about Floquet prethermalization in quantum systems, uh, and how is it different from, from, from classical prethermalization? Um, now, I, uh, another you know, a set of interesting questions that one can ask is you know, how we can use this Floquet engineering in classical systems. And here in classical systems, I envision you know, something like uh, uh, biophysics or maybe nanoengineering, where one can actually you know, exploit these high frequency uh, uh, dressing ideas to, to get some, effect, some new effects. Um, I should recall that you know, the very I'd say prototypical example of Floquet engineering is the classical Kapitza pendulum. So it kind of it all comes classically, you know, from classical physics. Uh, another question is, you know, what do the different variants of the inverse frequency expansion correspond to? So obviously they lead to very specific canonical transformations, which are probably related to, you know, Schiffer-Wolf transformation classically. So this would be also interesting to explore. Another thing that I was discussing with uh, when we went with uh, Wojciech is, you know. So, so far there's proofs, but the proofs that I know, they hold for uh, spins and for fermions. I haven't seen a proof for bosons, but bosons are relevant, especially experimentally. So um, this is also an open question here. Um, yeah, and at the very end, I wanted to say that, especially on the level of the quantum simulations, uh, we've developed a package which is open source and which I invite you to uh, go check out and uh, see whether it's useful to your research. Very useful for checking ideas quickly. So with it, I'd like to thank you for, for the attention. This resetting idea, I mean, you checked, of course, that the parameterization time scale also depends exponentially on the frequency, right? Yes, I... I, I, I they are, you say they, are, they could be orders of different, uh, orders of magnitude different, but they scale on frequency. Uh, I, I, I had this. Let me just go back real quick. So if you see here, um, you can see exactly the exponential uh, in the frequency. It is for the, the standard protocol. For, sorry? For the standard protocol, but then you had this uh, resetting idea. Then, I, then we had? Resetting. When you see resetting. Oh, the resetting. Yes, of course, of course, yes. Also, also for the resetting. It's also exponential. Yes, it's also exponential. What about doing something like that for quantum spin chain? 
Uh, this is, yeah, as I said, this is, this is an open question. Yeah, so we saw this in the classical one, and, and you could essentially do the same thing in the quantum one to see what's going to happen. Yes, this is one of the things on, on a to-do list. We, we have not, we have not uh, checked this. It's, it's kind of interesting, you know. It, it might be that just the very process of restarting does something weird to the system, so that, you know, we're not, we're not allowed to do this in some sense. Uh, but I would not see why, you know, if, 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 if the system has to be in a thermal state in the pre-thermal plateau, then all there is are two moments, right? Um, I should also say that this restarting is, is also independent of, of the system size, so it happens for all system sizes. I have two questions um, uh, regarding the first part of your talk. Um, uh, when you increase um, frequencies, or, so when you decrease frequencies and your resonances sort of get broader, yes. have you looked at the shape of these resonances? Are they Lorentzian? Are they describable by the golden rule? Things which I would expect. Uh, there is a recent paper by Marcus Rigol, um, which essentially, I think, gives very strong numerical evidence that they have to be described by the golden rule. Um, I have not checked this explicitly. It's very hard to uh, do any kind of uh, fitting on these because um, these are, let me just go back, these are resonances over, um, over many body states, and there are still very large very large finite size effect. So yes, if you smoothen things out, then maybe maybe you can ask the question of yeah, what is what is potentially the, yeah, the shape? so so we, we worked a bit on the related problem. So if you backfold everything in this sort of first flake zone right. and look at the average, then this sort of things can just smoothen up. That's true. Uh, actually, another thing to get them smoothen out uh, would be to average over temperature. This is something that I have done. So if you initialize your system from a finite temperature state. Uh, then uh, you're essentially doing more averaging over different sort of, you know, realizations uh, corresponding to different uh, energy values. Uh, and then you see, you see this story smoothen out. Okay. It's another way. But I have not investigated the tails uh, and, and, and the width, whether it's a Lorentzian, whether it's a Gaussian. Okay. And the second question... But, uh, sorry, j j just, just so that I, uh, one more thing comes to my mind. What I can say about the width of the resonances is that the width of the resonance has two contributions. There is a contribution that comes from uh, terms that lead to heating, to genuine heating, and then there is a contribution that comes from dressing of the, of the Floquet states. So if you actually compute these resonances not with respect to the zeroth order Floquet Hamiltonian, but with respect to higher order Floquet Hamiltonian in the, in the expansion, then these peaks become uh, very narrow at the same frequency. But there is still some finite width which is not captured by the expansion, and we know this because otherwise we wouldn't see a resonance, right? Okay. Uh, the second question, uh, it's, you have already been asked this question about this, um, your concerns that there are rounding errors in the computer, and so you, for that reason you just try to do everything exactly as much as possible. Uh, my sense is that, that this concern is a bit overstated, because, because when you have a chaotic system, it has its own Lyapunov exponent. And if you add to this computer rounding errors, it just slightly changes the Lyapunov exponent, and that's it. So, and you, when you have many body system, you have whole ensemble of Lyapunov exponents, and they just change slightly, but they basically remain the same. So, in this regard, the, the fact that you see that individual tra trajectories deviate, it's very natural, uh, because Lyapunov exponents are just tiny bit different. But the ensemble should be nearly identical, so so one should not be that much concerned about uh, the rounding errors. And then the, the the related question would be: Have you looked at any dependence of this prethermalization regime on the values of the Lyapunov exponents in your system? Uh, we I certainly have not looked at at Lyapunov exponents. Uh, this I can say right away. Um, about the first part, yes, I, I agree what you're saying. The reason, uh, you know, why, why we decided to stick with this step drive uh, is because, you know, I really want to make statements here about, you know, times like 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 cycles. So I just want to be on the safe side, and I think there's nothing wrong with being on the safe side. Like, um, you know, it's, it's also more efficient than, than uh, solving it another way anyway, so.
I did not really understand your point about uh, not taking individual trajectories instead of ensembles. I mean, if you have a, a very large system and you have a quantity that averages, why is that not the same of taking a single? You start with uh, yes, yes, like a single trajectory, and uh, if you average it, should, it of course, should be the but same you know, a quantity that that averages in statistical mechanics sense, at least the way I understand it, is I measure this quantity, you know, at subsequent times, right? And then essentially this gives me an ensemble uh, uh, in which I measure the expectation value. That's the way I understand. Uh, it could also be spatial, right? I mean, you you had a formula of something we there is some yes, of, some good, of local good, good. terms. Yes, no, that's that's a good point. So there is also there is also sp uh, spatial averaging. So if, if for example this magnetization that I was showing, where one is actually summing over all sites, there is also averaging that happens over the lattice, which helps. Yes, you can view this as a you know as an ensemble itself. Yes. I mean, would the, the this thermalization time, for example, scale with the size of the initial solution that is? This one I do have. What? Oh no, I didn't. Did I put it in? Oh yeah, I did put it in. This log is the of the size. Uh, so, okay, we didn't investigate exactly the scaling law, but uh, so the distribution is a uniform distribution, uh, you know, um, where uh, the width is minus P over W uh, to P over W. And then what we did is we chose different value of W. So you can see that, you know, W can be small or it can be large, and these are different frequencies that I'm showing you. So there's almost no effect. The initial distribution. This is the initial distribution, exactly. This is the width of the initial distribution. Shouldn't it be like log of W or M? I mean, we just we just try different values to 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 make sure that you know our our effects are not yeah are not depend and do not depend on on this. Of course, if this distribution becomes too uh, too broad, right? Uh, then then of course you know you're sampling all kind of energies right away, so uh, you'll see it heating up much much faster. Um, yes. But right now, it's not changing with much with. It's not. Yeah, it's also. I mean, we're also not changing the uh, the uh, width of the distribution much, right? We're changing it by a factor of ten in the smaller direction. Okay. So, if no other questions, let's thank. Uh, Maria. <laughs>